Uh, I'm at Rady Children's Hospital. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at US, uh, UCSD. I um, also have a PhD in biophysics uh, from the University of Southern California, which potentially alters the way I, I approach problems and think about things. I'm talking about primary syrinxes, so these aren't syrinxes related to a Chiari malformation. Uh, they're more problematic, they're less predictable, um, they can recur rapidly, uh, they can recur multiply. It really depends on why they're there. It's considered to be an orphan disease just because they're so rare, uh, but if uh, you happen to have this type of a syrinx, uh, they're not rare. Uh, I'm gonna briefly define the different type of syrinxes that we see. Um, I think we've mentioned earlier, hydromyelia just means that that central canal lining, the ependymal cells, surrounds the fluid of the syrinx. If it doesn't, then that's syringomyelia. Some people get it all mixed up and just call it syringohydromyelia. So you kind of get a catch term that covers everything. So if you're looking at this, and I don't know if this is, this is the central canal. It's also interesting to notice all these little indentations and lines because that's where a lot of the blood supply to the cord come. And that's gonna be of some interest uh, in, in just a little bit. So this would be hydromyelia, where you essentially have an ependymal lining. And this would be a syringomyelia, where the cavity can have partially an ependymal lining, but also can stray into the parenchymal tissue of the cord. Uh, these are worrisome for different reasons, just because you can get local injury to tissue of the cord. Location is how we also consider things. You know, how far up is the extent of the syrinx? Syringobulbia is a syrinx that extends into the medulla, or cervical medullary junction and above. Syringopontia extends into the pons. And finally, we have extension into the midbrain. Uh, this is important because the presentation of symptoms uh, and the course of things have a lot to do with the vertical uh, extent of the syrinx. And a lot of the problems that may be difficult to discern uh, without imaging make a lot of sense when you see the extent of these. Um, the reasoning behind this is that these can occur secondary to a number of different type of injuries, if you will. They can be traumatic in nature. They can be atraumatic. They can be tumor related. Trauma can be direct trauma, bullets, knives, uh, bone shards going into the cord, surgical related. Anytime you operate in the cord, you're creating trauma. Bleeding, usually from a vascular malformation or a trauma. Uh, stroke, where you uh, basically don't get enough oxygenated blood to the cord and it dies. Atraumatic ischemia, where you're in a state where there is compensation, the tissue's staying alive, but it's not remaining optimally functional. Uh, tumor formation uh, and stenosis, stenosis, spondylosis, things of that sort, which I'll also talk about. Uh, these are common things that we see as we get older, uh, and there is some association with uh, syrinxes in this population. Tumors, is it a tumor involving the tissue of the spinal cord? Or is it extrinsic where it's pushing on the cord and creating compromise? Is the tumor associated with a cyst? That's important because it may appear to be a syrinx cyst, but usually it's a tumor cyst. It's fluid specifically related to the tumor. Bleed. A lot of tumors can hemorrhage into the cord. Complicating all of this is inflammation, immune response to whatever is happening, whether it be from a surgery, from an infection, uh, from an adverse response to a foreign material that we put in. Uh, but this is a significant problem because it takes all of these issues and makes them much, much more difficult to understand, much more difficult to diagnose, much more difficult to treat. Uh, and, and that's what really becomes most problematic and worrisome about this disease. And we see that most notably in trauma, uh, bleeding into the cord, and obviously any time we perform a surgery. So is there a uniform etiology? Is there some great way to have one physical consideration that defines why somebody will form a syrinx, uh, whether it be 
from any of these conditions? Uh, can that then be applied to why we develop syrinx in patients that have uh, Chiari malformations? There's a, a theory by uh, an author uh, by the name of Heiss that um, I think has some legitimacy and seems to make sense. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm gonna be talking about. There are many different theories. I'm not saying this is the one, this isn't the one. It makes sense to me. Uh, I could be completely wrong, but, but it fits at least with my mindset now. Um, when you're talking about two tr actual true trauma to the cord, um, you worry about progressive deficits, but these can come at the type of trauma or farther down the line. Um, there's also the worrisome progression that can lead from just presence of a syrinx to expansion of a syrinx to an actual paraplegia uh, in one to 4% of people with these type of injuries. Um, as was just discussed, we're seeing a lot more in the way of Chiari's, syrinxes, and, and other things because we get so many more MRIs. Uh, MRIs are safe, uh, so it's something that we can do and we're not taking chances. Uh, spine disease. The association of a syrinx with spine disease is an important consideration, uh, and, and it's something we don't see in kids, or rarely see in kids. So a tight canal uh, can result in a syrinx, and I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. Uh, once again, the most worrisome thing is post-inflammatory uh, syrinxes uh, or tetherings of the cord. Uh, when you have an inflammatory response, the cord can stick to the dura uh, via the scar that we create whether it be operating or from a traumatic injury, uh, and that makes things difficult. And it makes things difficult surgically in trying to figure out what's the correct thing to do. Um, all of these things have some mechanism where they occlude the normal flow of CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And I think that that's, um, that's kind of where this theory seems to have more impact. If I cut through the spinal cord and we're looking down at it, you can see all those little dark brown lines and such. And these are all avenues by which blood vessels bring oxygenated blood into the tissue of the cord. And you can see this is the dura. This is basically just a model or schematic close up. That's the subarachnoid space where the cerebral spinal fluid is sitting. These are blood vessels and around the blood vessels, uh, as was mentioned, two days ago is kind of like uh, an intake of fresh water and then a sewer leaving it. So you're bringing in certain nutrients and such via the CSF and you're removing certain waste products and toxins and such. If you're looking at the column of CSF, which is white, obviously the gray being the cord, um, this column acts as a number of speed bumps. So when you have an increase in pressure, whether it be from pulsation of the heart, from Valsalva, um, a wave travels down this fluid-filled space uh, and that propagation is dissipated by these speed bumps, imaginary speed bumps, if you will. Uh, if you obstruct the space or make it smaller, uh, then you're impeding the ability for the speed bumps to work. So, there has to be somewhere else for this fluid to go, uh, and that other place the fluid can go is through these spaces around the blood vessels. And so that's kind of the unifying hypothesis that uh, I thought made good sense, but the continuation of this propagation and force uh, is what is making syrinxes wider, longer, uh, and more problematic. And once again, in a traumatic syrinx, in a syrinx from a tumor, uh, from surgery, these are uh, having behaviors that are much more unexpected. And so these are the, the spaces that I'm talking about once again. And once again, compression of that canal can create a problem where you're not getting the speed bump phenomena. Uh, having a mass on the outside of the cord, blood, tumor, uh, expansion of the cord itself. Um, these are all problems that can potentially result in formation of a syrinx. Uh, briefly want to talk about communicating versus non-communicating. Communicating just means that the syrinx communicates with the normal CSF pathways uh, through the ventricular system of the brain, through the fourth ventricle, uh, and into the syrinx. 
If there is no communication, then that's considered to be non-communicating. Why do we worry about this? Um, I think we worry about it based upon surgical considerations. This is a very simple rendition. If I cut through the cord and look in it like a book, you can see I've marked out what was cord and what was cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, and everything we do is, is based upon the chance of benefiting somebody versus the risk of hurting somebody uh, and having it so much in favor of benefit um, that it's worthwhile to take that non-existent risk or small risk. So you have a syrinx and in a normal scenario, that's difficult enough. Uh, if you're dealing with something that is no longer surrounded by a pendema, you're then dealing with the consideration of tissue damage uh, or a much larger percentage chance of hurting somebody. If that area is loculated, has a bunch of septa in it, then any one of these septated off uh, areas can get bigger independently of the others. So if you're dealing in this, you also have to open these sept up to allow for communication. Are there secondary cysts or syrinxes of all tertiary? Are any of those getting bigger or acting differently than the primary syrinx that you're initially worried about? Is this associated with hemorrhage? You can have inflammation when you have hemorrhage and that creates a scenario that's worrisome. Uh, is the cord larger? So is the syrinx getting bigger, but the cord is not large? So there's no apparent movement of the cord, extension of the cord, uh, which can really impact your desire to operate because if there isn't, um, it provides a very different pathway than if there is. Tumor related, is the cyst from tumor-based fluid? Is there a tumor recurrence that you're not picking up on an MRI without contrast that's leading to enlargement or recurrence? Adhesions. What I was talking about before is the act of operating uh, leads to scarring. That scarring can lead to attachment of the cord through the area that we operate through uh, and make it so the cord is no longer moving as it should. It's no longer free and surrounded by fluid. Uh, and that tethering phenomena, I think, is the most worrisome thing that I deal with uh, because a lot of our efforts are directed at untethering a cord. When you're talking about actual trauma to the spinal cord, uh, about 1% to 7% of people uh, are noted to develop a clinically symptomatic syrinx. Once again, is this an increase in numbers? It's difficult to say because we're seeing more syrinxes in addition to caries because we get a lot more in the way of films. We follow patients for longer. So we're seeing a lot of things happen that were limited previously. Trauma can lead to an obstruction of CSF flow for just a, a myriad of reasons. Uh, fractures, scar tissue, hemorrhage, uh, arachnoid uh, adhesions from inflammatory response, a penetrating injury, uh, just a number of things all of which can create a compromise that's difficult to surgically address. The timing is also difficult because the duration following injury um, to diagnosis could range from one month to 45 years. So there's an extraordinarily long period of time where somebody can develop a syrinx and then have progression, uh, and it can be very difficult to relate to anything, much less trauma. So these are difficult numbers, but it, it's difficult just because there's such a wide uh, possibility of response. Where the trauma occurs, um, thoracic injuries tend to be associated more often uh, with syrinxes than cervical injuries. Uh, the incidence of syrinx is uh, higher in older patients. It's obviously higher when you have a complete injury of the spinal cord, whether it be a section or transection of the cord or diffuse vascular injury that creates a paraplegia or a quadriplegia. <coughs> tumor is another issue, and I've mentioned that. Is the tumor cyst actually part of the syrinx? Is it spilling and creating a syrinx? Uh, or is it just purely tumor related? Um, the type of tumor can have impact. Astrocytomas, which are uh, intrinsic, involve the tissue of the cord, uh, can have large satellite cysts that actually aren't syrinxes. Uh, pendomomas can be associated with hemorrhage into themselves, which can create a syrinx or an inflammatory response that can make that syrinx harder to deal with. 
hemangioblastomas or a different type of tumor have mural nodules, uh, frequently can be associated with a true syrinx, uh, but also have a lot of swelling, a lot of potential bleeding. Uh, and so all of these need to, to be treated differently despite the fact they're all tumors. The problem with the tumor-related syrinx is the outcomes tend to be guarded. Uh, people that have neurologic deficits at the time of presentation have the worst outcomes. People with metastatic disease with or without syrinx rarely live beyond 12 months. Uh, pain control is a primary issue. We tend to be more aggressive in dealing with pain in these patients given that there is a limitation on longevity. Um, it's important to involve specialists with regard to the administration of medications uh, to get good pain control uh, while avoiding addiction, especially if you're using narcotics or opioids. Um, as with everything, a multidisciplinary approach is essential in managing these patients and all of these patients. Spine disease. The presence of spondylosis, which is basically degenerative changes of the spine, uh, rarely can be associated with the syrinx. Um, it's uncertain as to why this occurs. Some people think that there is an arachnoid inflammatory response at the level of the spondylosis. The worse the spondylosis or the worse the disease, the greater the size of the syrinx. Um, these are different also in that not only can the syrinx be at the level of the spondylosis, it can extend below the spondylosis, it can also extend above the spondylosis. Uh, so a different behavior than we're used to seeing with other type of syrinxes. Heiss is the person that described the mechanism, the speed bump mechanism that I had talked about before. Briarly actually put tracers into cerebral spinal fluid uh, and watched those tracers move from the subarachnoid space uh, into the perivascular spaces I've been talking about and actually into the syrinx formation. So suggesting that there was some truth to this hypothesis. When we're dealing with the spondylosis and a syrinx associated with that, our treatment isn't directed at the syrinx, it's basically directed at the disease. Uh, whether decompressing the spondylosis, doing something uh, to mitigate the fact that there's compression, um, but you're not dealing with the cyst themselves. Um, they don't require drainage, uh, they're not removed. And in fact, the majority of patients with asymptomatic syrinxes usually stabilize or have regression of the syrinxes without need for surgery when you treat the primary disease, which is basically a stenotic or a tight canal. The rest of it is, is basically, I consider as a dance where to make it work, you need two people on the same page. And that's probably with a more organized dance as opposed to a wedding dance where people have been drinking and random things happen. <laughs> this middle picture is, is part of a portfolio of somebody with Chiari malformation um, and a rendition of how they envision themselves with Chiari. Um, the upper right is uh, a rendition of Chiari headache or Chiari head pain. Uh, and below is uh, a Greek image of uh, how they used to treat uh, curvature of the spine, which I'm assuming sometimes associated with syrinx formation, uh, and how long this has been a real problem, uh, but something we're just still learning about. So in a dance, there's partners. One of the partners is you. Um, that's important because a lot of people have pain with syrinxes and Chiari malformations. The pain can be extraordinarily variable. And this here is basically a description of the types of pain people can commonly complain of. The issue that we need to know about is when that pain changes. Is it more frequent? Does it feel different? Is it going into different places? Because that can be an indication with these primary syrinxes that something is wrong, that there's expansion of the syrinx, there's a bleed into that region, recurrence of tumor, uh, recurrence of a vascular malformation that you thought you cured. Um, ascending sensory abnormalities, especially in traumatic syrinx, numbness heading up your body, uh, can be difficult to pick up as something you need to pick up because that's information that really uh, makes what we do much easier. Uh, losing things that you had before, uh, bowel and bladder function, ability to get an erection, all things that uh, 
just need to be documented early. The earlier we find out about these things, the more quickly we can act upon them. Us, responsibility. Uh, your physicians need to be responsible for taking all of this and doing something about it. Um, what's the history of your weakness now that things have changed? Are you early in the cycle? Are you later in the cycle? Uh, are your sensory abnormalities just an absence of sensation or is it related to a dissociation like you would see with the carry malformation? Uh, are there changes in tone? Are there changes in your spasticity or your baseline level of spasticity? Do you have autonomic changes? Hyperhidrosis, which are basically sweaty hands. Um, variability in heart rate and blood pressure instability. Um, your deep tendon reflexes, which you won't be able to assess, but we can assess, is there a difference? Are they decreased? Are they increased? Is there asymmetry? Uh, and then me following this up. Uh, usually imaging uh, is probably our first choice. Uh, MRI can tell you a lot, but a lot of times uh, there's a lack of correlation between your symptoms and the size of your serous cavity. You may have expansion of the cavity with no symptoms, and you may have no uh, obvious changes in the size of the cavity with complaints that would likely be referable to the syrinx. Uh, CT myelography is helpful in that not only can it give you an image, but it can give you a sense of the physiology, uh, what's actually happening that's negative. Uh, where's the obstruction to cerebral spinal fluid flow uh, that could be contributing to this problem? Uh, lastly, electrodiagnostics, getting studies to try to figure out, is something else causing your progression? Is something else causing your pain? Is something else resulting in the things you're complaining of that have nothing to do with the syrinx? Treatment, treatment usually coming down to surgery. Uh, progressive symptoms and or disability result in surgery. The type of surgery really is surgeon dependent, uh, but also presentation dependent. Uh, small cysts and asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic patients really don't need an initial surgery. Uh, I prefer to watch those. One problem being a large cyst moves the cord out of the way and you have a very thin amount of cord that when you go through it in the midline, your chances of hurting somebody are much less than a smaller cyst cavity where there's a thick amount of cord that you have to go through where your chances of hurting somebody are much larger. Then comes the question, which is kind of the teeter-totter, operating versus not operating. So some patients can have spontaneous regression of the cyst. So that's one side of the consideration. On the other hand, if you wait and there's progressive disease, uh, that can lead to neurologic worsening in almost 68% of patients. So it's difficult. So if your surgeon's not offering a rapid surgery, a rapid intervention and trying to watch it, it's because you're trying to balance these things, trying to see what the progression or history is gonna be um, while trying not to hurt somebody, either by the syrinx itself or by surgery itself. My current approach is surgically or reestablishing normal CSF flow, uh, whether it's areas that are narrowed because of dural scar, uh, adhesions, spinal cord tethering. Uh, that is the problem. Uh, as I said before, you can always address the primary problem, whether it's a tumor, a vascular malformation, uh, or just a stenosis at a certain level of your spine. Um, and that's a better way to proceed but you're usually not afforded that luxury and you're usually dealing with some kind of tethering and some kind of scarring phenomena. Uh, laminectomy, removal of bone, exploring the area, removing these adhesions, uh, widening of the CSF space that we talked about, which is duroplasty, uh, and shunting really last. Uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of shunting if we can avoid it. Sometimes that's your only recourse. Um, with any of these, you can get a good result, but you can get a recurrence. And recurrence is much more likely when you're dealing with these primary type of syrinxes, these non-Chiari type of syrinxes. And that's why the follow-up tends to be more frequent um, and just uh, more intensive. So shunting of a syrinx cavity, why am I not a fan? Uh, they get blocked. 
shunts plug up. It's like a toilet. It can get plugged up. The problem is, is surgery is the plunger. Um, they can move if you don't adequately suture um, uh, your catheter in place. I've had catheters move and get pulled into the syrinx or get pulled out of the syrinx. Uh, and that's problematic because if that hole closes, then, then everything you've created surgically is, is no longer working. Um, for those people that do have surgery in these scenarios, the best response is usually with regard to radicular pain or pain. So when we advise patients following these procedures of what we can potentially improve, it's usually pain. Uh, autonomic symptoms, uh, spasticity, not so much. The purpose of surgery is not to improve the spasticity. It's to decrease the progression. Uh, but pain seems to be something that uh, we have good success. Uh, some people stayed up to 90% success in improving or diminishing pain in these patients. Uh, somebody asked earlier, and, and this is innovation, if you're interested in the consideration of mesenchymal stem cells and such, uh, most literature is regarding traumatic syrinx, severe cord injury followed by syrinx formation. So if you just Google syrinx and stem cells, I always put peer after it that will put you in uh, to arena where you can see some of these papers and find out if there are studies, if these are the type of syrinxes that you have. Follow-up and treatment, serial neurologic exams. I mean, these are such an important part, uh, not only of your recognition of what's going on, but of our ability to find something that's different, different from your baseline. Because none of you is likely to have a perfect baseline. Uh, but understanding that and looking for a deterioration of that is important. Uh, your ability to report changes in functioning to us and us taking advantage of that and doing something about it. Um, that's a very important part of follow-up. Um, where is your syrinx? Cervical syrinx as you worry about pulmonary function, breathing. Uh, very different considerations if they're cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. Uh, multiple team members involved. Uh, you can't have too many people involved in, in the follow-up and care uh, of somebody with this issue. Uh, and by doing all of this, you're trying to mitigate all of the complications that can occur with these. Numbness, weakness, spasticity, sweaty palms, hypotension, progressive scoliosis, bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, emotional instability, chronic pain, just the myriad uh, of problems that many of you have experienced uh, some of these and why you're here. Next, uh, and this is really what I think is the approach, uh, who's following you? Uh, a neurosurgeon is good, but it's not good enough. You need neurosurgery, uh, you need people that can do electrodiagnostics, you need nursing, you need social work, you need PT and OT, you need pain specialists, urology, psychology, psychiatry, cognitive management. Uh, everything about this conference has been talking about all of these things, people have touched upon all of these things at this conference, and that's why a lot of these talks are uh, included, is to try to give you a sense of all of the potential things that can be done, that need to be done, uh, when not to take no for an answer, uh, because that's very important. Lastly, the emotional and physical challenges can be significant, and um, just because you have a paretic extremity, um, or loss of sensation, uh, and maybe even some improvement in your activities of daily living are at baseline and your autonomy is at baseline, uh, but the emotional and physical challenges are sometimes insurmountable. So getting the assistance for that is vitally important because uh, as was discussed yesterday, these are heavy weights that can pull you out of a good place and put you in a bad place. And the result is, progression of signs and symptoms, not necessarily that something's getting worse, namely a syrinx, um, but you're just not doing the things you need to do to maintain that stability in motor function, sensory function, and so on. Um, as physicians, if we have options to treat somebody, um, we need to discuss them and we need to discuss the potential benefits and risks 
Uh, most notably, people tend to be worried about pain. So what are the things we can do about pain? Uh, what are our chances to leading to resolution of the pain? Uh, and lastly, no matter where you are on the spectrum uh, of this disease, aggressive rehabilitation. Uh, I have here following surgery, uh, but to improve motor function, to potentially improve sensation, to improve all the things that are either static or decreasing. Uh, and especially as a combination to other types of treatment, namely PTOT and surgery, uh, I think these are some of the vital steps that people need to, to take. Uh, the entirety of this, this conference, I've tried to incorporate all of these things. I kind of cherry picked today and really brought some of the best people we have in San Diego to talk about novel ideas, uh, novel things, things that you might not have heard about. Um, but I think that's important because that's why you come to these conferences to get a sense of what's new, what's different, uh, what you can use to pursue the problem that you haven't gotten before. Uh, so that was a big part of this. Uh, I hope we were able to deliver on that. Um, it looks like we're starting to deliver on sunshine. Uh, anybody who was at the zoo, we weren't able to deliver on half the zoo animals, um, <laughs> but we tried. But uh, I really am happy that everybody came, and I hope it was informative and useful for you. Thank you. Thanks.